Welcome to God's Church on this, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Our communities of faith have one great aim and purpose, to help people grow in life-giving relationships with their neighbors, with their own selves, with the earth, and with God. That's why we have come together. That's why we're glad you've joined us here today. My name is Adam Ahrens. I serve as the pastor at North Beaver Creek Lutheran Church. And he's not really here. He's on vacation. (laughs) But I'm Pastor Paul uh, from Blair Lutheran Church, and we recorded this, so we are still here virtually. Just for you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess confess that we we have have not followed your your path, path, but have have chosen chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we we long to take the best seats at the the table. table. When When met by those in need, we have have too often passed by on the other other side. side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, For the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. 
for your people here who have come to give you praise for the strength to live your word let us pray to the lord, lord have mercy christ have mercy lord have mercy help save and defend us God, we are like artisans building a cathedral. We are engaged in work that will outlive us. The building of justice to which you have called us will take generations. Your kingdom will not come to be overnight. And knowing this, we let, let us not grow weary or lose heart. Sustain us by the memories by those who have come before by those who endured so that we may be brought this far. Help us to carry on against all odds, against all opposition. Let us not be intimidated by the thought that we will not achieve our goal in our lifetime. Of course not. This is not for us, but it is for our children's children's children. Let not discouragement, despair, and even death trouble us. For our lives are insignificant in the shadow of this work, which bestows its blessings to the ends of the earth and to generations far beyond us. Let us take courage, for you, God, are in this. This is where, though we are small, we become immortal. Amen. The first reading today is from the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my names, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. <laughs> How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back those whose prophecy lies and whose prophecy the deceit who, and those who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell a dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Word of God, word of life. 
Thanks be to God. Our psalm today comes from Psalm 82. God stands to charge the divine council assembled, giving judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan, defend the humble and the needy, rescue the weak and the poor, deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They wander about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of your children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. A reading from Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. God. Holy Gospel according to Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three, they will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know? how to interpret the, ple- the present time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. So, I once knew a woman who was named Esther. Now, Esther, uh, when I knew her, was older, but in her younger days, she had learned to play piano and the organ. And she even played 
the organ for silent films. I was so fascinated by that story. And when we would gather together with Esther, we would hear the stories of her performing music all over the place. First, she would play organ for her church in Sibley, Illinois, a tiny little town on the prairie. And she played that organ for over 70 years in the same church. She and her husband, Oli, played in a jug band at all the local festivals, gathered people together to play music. And when I went to visit my great-grandma and great-grandpa, as they were for me, we would gather in their kitchen that had an organ in one side and a piano on the other side, and she would sit down and play some music. And my great-grandpa showed me how to play the spoons, which I don't really know how to play, but it was fun to hit back and forth. And he would accompany us on harmonica. And I think of Esther because my great-grandma, who lived to be 100 years old, was a person who personified a constant and continuing faith. She went to church every week and played that music so that her community would know the love of God, so that she could participate in a bigger picture and make real the body of Christ where she was. I also think today of Willard. Now, those of you who live in a small town know that in many small towns, there's one guy who is the unofficial mayor. And my grandfather was the unofficial mayor of Walker, Minnesota. He, uh, wherever he went, if he traveled, he would start a, a conversation with people and he would talk to them and he would say, he would somehow find a way, a connection between them and Walker, Minnesota. He was an advocate for his small town. He talked about it everywhere. He was basically uh, an apostle for Walker, Minnesota. And he was well known by everyone. He gathered weekly with his, his friends and uh, the older folks to talk every week. He worked at the local grocery store for years, knew all the kids and all the people coming up. He went to all the baseball games and the basketball games and the football games. He was well known in the community. So much so that the people may, gave him the honor of being the, uh, the head of the parade uh, that, comes, that comes every summer. And he also was an example to me of what it means to spread God's love. Not by saying hi, God loves you, but by making a connection with another person, with a stranger, by saying, even though I didn't know you five seconds ago, we are connected in a way. We are connected through the people we know. We make connections where we go. This is how God's love works. This is how the body of Christ comes together. When times are tough, when faith is wavering, I like to think these days of Esther, great-grandma Becker, and Grandpa Will. I think of their continued faith in family, their faith in community, and their faith in God's presence and action in this church. Jesus warns today that following his path, following a path of radical love toward neighbor, is going to cause division in your family. It may pit parent against child. It's going to pit brother against brother, sister against sister. I'm guessing it wouldn't take long for you to think of a few people who have distanced themselves from their family or friends due to their religious beliefs. Perhaps you've had to put distance between yourself and people you know because you come to church, because you believe in the love that Christ has given to you and that that means, that love means that all are welcome in God's house. Maybe you felt that division very closely. We look around at the other churches in our communities, and we see that the story of Christianity has been one of multiplication by division. Our disagreements on what the Bible means and what doctrines guide our faith on who is welcome and who is not has been how we have ended up with so many different denominations in this country especially, some of which we agree with more than others. And yet... And yet, even in that division, we trust that Jesus, the Jesus we know in our lives, the Christ who comes to us, 
the Jesus that those who went before us know and knew in their daily lives. That same Jesus of Esther and Willard is the same Jesus of all these different denominations, even in our disagreements. The body of Christ is messy, and Jesus knew it was going to be a little messy. When faith is difficult, when believing feels empty, when, we, when our minds start to wonder, what's God all about, really? And when I have my moments and say, where are you, God? I've started to think about those who have gone before me in faith. Those who the writer of Hebrews t- talks about and trusted, like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites through the Red Sea and the desert, Rahab, and Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Those who we read about in the Bible who held on to their faith in a God who promises to be with us even when things are hard, even when life seems against us, even when there seems to be no way through the sea, no way to know that our faith will continue. When we see only division around us, these saints in the faith remind us what living in faith means. For me personally, those saints include Esther and Grandpa Will, who continued to return to their faith as a guide in their lives and a center of their communities, a representation of the body of Christ. They, for me, are that great cloud of witnesses. So, who's on your cloud? I invite you to think of a name or two today of the people who were examples of faith to you. Maybe take out some paper. Maybe draw a little cloud on it and write their names in the middle. Put it up on your fridge. Put it up by your door, somewhere where you'll see it. So as you go out the door, you will remember that you do not go alone. Remind yourself that you are not alone on this way of faith. Not only is our God in Christ who came to to earth to show us how to love with with you in the Spirit right now, but so are those you have known, who have shown you what a life of faith means every day. Who is in your great cloud of witnesses? Who are those saints in faith that get you back on track? Who is Esther and Willard to you? Friends, there's no doubt that our world knows division in so many ways. And when we're honest, we know that our churches are sometimes the center of those places of division. They can be places of disagreement. But following Jesus brings with it a difference and a division and sometimes a dissonance with those who do not follow Jesus. Yet on our way following Jesus, we have examples with us in our cloud of how to continue how to persist in faith, trusting that God will be with us, God will provide, Christ will show us the way, so that even in our division, we know that there is an invitation, a welcome that never leaves. In our world of disagreement, our great cloud of witnesses goes with us, reminding us that in our faith, God is with us, promising to see us safely through. May we be reminded of that cloud of witnesses every day, and trust in the one whose steadfast love brings reconciliation. Amen. Forth in fields.
breaks like morning, where'er your face appears. Your cross is lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. Our crown awaits the conquest, we honor no God of might. Let us join now in the profession of our faith and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. And flame us, O oh God to sustain your church. We pray for all who dedicate their lives to serving your people. Renew our commitment to our siblings in faith around the globe and bless the work of our ecumenical and interfaith partners. And inflame us, O oh God, to sustain your creation. We pray for all places affected by natural disasters. Transform the devastation of floods and fires into fertile ground for new life and growth. Fill heaven and earth with your life-giving spirit. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. And flame us, O oh God, and sustain the nations. We pray for all elected officials. Kindle in them a desire to administer your justice. Strengthen their resolve to defend those who are vulnerable and to stand publicly against all forms of oppression. Inflame us, O oh God, and sustain those who are oppressed. We pray for people harmed by racist discrimination, ableist discrimination, and all people discriminated against based on their gender identity or sexual orientation. Rescue us from all systems that degrade our fellow human beings. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. And flame us, O God, to sustain this community. We pray for this community, celebrating with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. In our joy and in our tears, be near us. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we remember the saints who have gone before us. May we run with perseverance the race set before us until we find our rest in you. Receive these the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus the Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Please share a word of peace.
we hope that you can take a moment to remember our congregations in your giving. Your offerings continue to support our ministry, which continues to reach out to those in need and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ in our community. So we invite you to take a moment to get an envelope and send in uh, your offering if you can. And uh, if not that, we encourage you to give your offering to other communities, other organizations that continue to help those in need and spread the good news of Christ throughout the world. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, let us praise your name and join their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and then he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so together as the body of Christ, we proclaim the mystery of faith until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us to love so that we might feed the world. And now as we are gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us.
In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet and let us become what we receive. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, strengthen you, inspire you, and give you peace. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live our lives for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. May the Eucharist be a fire that inflames you. May we depart from this altar breathing fire, ready to take on the evil of the world with grace and peace and love. May your life be a brush in the very hand of God, painting new creation into every nook and cranny that your shadow graces. Be courageous. Be free. Prune that which needs pruning and water that which thirsts for righteousness. You are the body of Christ, the light of the world. So pick up your hammer, your brush, your skillet, your pen. Pick up your head and walk, run, dance, fly. The great artist has called you into being. So go into your world, your valley, or your garden and create with his grace and in his peace. Amen. And our sending song is, As You Go On Your Way. peace to love and serve your neighbor. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
God, give us grace and open our hearts and minds to hear your true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our minds. Amen. This is a difficult text because it, it seems at odds with what a lot of what Jesus has been preaching lately. So what is the difference between the divisiveness that we see in our culture today and the dividedness with which Jesus is speaking here? I mean, the core of the gospel message and its proper use is to unite us. It's to bind us together. That's what the word religion, religio, that's what it means to bind us together, to knit us together in holy love, to unify us into the body of Christ for the sake of the world. So, so what's going on with Jesus here? Talking about fire and bringing division? Is he having a bad day? <laughs> no. You know, he's speaking to the disciples and to the assembled crowds that have just heard the parable of the rich fool that we heard a couple of weeks ago. And they were warned that we need to be on our toes to be faithful at all times. I think in this section, I think he might be equally parts exasperated and sad. In a part of the reading that we haven't read, uh, Peter has just asked a clueless question. Just, who are you talking to, Peter says. And I think Jesus is also profoundly sad because he recognizes that choosing to follow him will inevitably cause division between people, even between family members. Okay, here's a, an exercise for you to think about. Imagine that you're a Christian family and you're either a Biden supporter or a Trump supporter. And when you get together for a meal, the insults fly hot and heavy against the other guy. Now, what would happen if you chose to speak of the other guy with respect and not join in the name calling that the rest of the family does. And you also choose to look at everything the other guy does and look at it in the best possible light. I mean, that is actually follow the eighth commandment. <laughs> Can you imagine the division that that would cause? And now even attending church, you know, remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. How many of your families are split along lines of the value or necessity of attending church? Some think you should do it every week. Some do it when it's convenient with your sports schedules. Some think Christmas and Easter is enough. And some have stopped altogether. Or how about giving money to people who are begging at the side of the road? The internet and newspapers are filled with division on how we should treat immigrants and refugees, on how or whether we should feed the hungry or how or whether we should help the poor. There is division. And even when we might agree on the outcomes, we don't always agree on the methods. Jesus is sad because he can see that division will happen because of people choosing to follow him. In this passage, Jesus is making the point that human togetherness, being the same, being homogenous, is not what the gospel is about. The gospel gets preached into our lives, is accepted into the life of each individual, and left to do its transforming work. We then have to work together, respecting that the gospel works within us, each in different ways. We, each one of us individually, do not have a monopoly on the truth. Division, in and of itself, is not a problem. It's our response to division that causes the problems. And you know, we always get to choose how we respond. And if we insist on control and strong arming our position so that we can win, we are not living out the gospel. If, however, our response is to work together in spite of our disagreements, 
then we're living out the gospel. The effect of the gospel will be division because many people want to continue their me first, I'm right attitudes and will oppose those who choose to live by the gospel. Jesus has experienced this division firsthand. Back in chapter 8, his mother and his brothers tried to reach him in a crowd, and he said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Can you imagine how his relatives felt? So the gospel rearranges even our families. The gospel is also a fire, a baptism of fire and the Holy Spirit. What's the nature of this fire? Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, this fire is equated with the refiner's fire. That is, it's a fire that burns away impurities and melts away other metals that would weaken or tarnish. It's a fire that purifies and strengthens. When you are on fire with the Spirit, you persevere. You don't grow weary or lose heart. You carry on despite all odds, against all opposition. And even though we may not live to see the justice of God complete here on earth, we still do it. We still seek that justice. When have you been on fire? When have you persevered through odds and opposition? In some people, it's a, it's a drive to succeed in a career or to assist a child in achieving something or maybe battling back from an illness or an injury. We've all experienced that fire burning within us somehow, somewhere. Jesus is trying to kindle this fire in his followers to help bring about the kingdom of God here on this earth. Jesus is here to disrupt the ways of the world. Jesus recognizes that this is going to cause division. Think back to when you have been on fire for something, or you've witnessed somebody else on fire for something. It causes division, right? Some folks cheer you on, but there are also some who kind of only idly watch, and some who actively try to put that fire out. You know, you'll never make it as a... Or, is it really worth losing your... Or, are you sure this is the right thing for you? Division happens. Somewhere along the line, we've mistaken unity for complacency and avoidance. Maybe it's that whole Norwegian conflict avoidance thing. I don't know. But we avoid truly living out the gospel so that we don't offend or make waves. Consequently, we really don't enter into the difficult work of doing God's justice. That is, standing with the oppressed, advocating for the less privileged, speaking truth to power. When was the last time that you called someone out for putting someone down or making a stereotype because of their race? When was the last time that you called someone out for a joke or a comment that made a stereotype of gender or ability? When have you called someone out or a business for discrimination that didn't directly affect you? Because when we do these things, we are part of God's refining fire. We are part of the solution. We are advocating for the kingdom of God to be here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus yearns for the kingdom of God to break forth into the world in all its fullness. The transformations and justice that come through this refining fire means that oppression gets burned away. Greed gets burned away. Idolatry gets burned away. The same with exploitation, dehumanization, narcissism, and many other evils that we can name that prevent the flourishing of all people and all creation. 
So what does this text have to say to us today? Well, first, we should not, should never use Jesus' words here to excuse poor behaviors toward one another in our families, our congregations, or between churches. We hear in Jesus' words that we are fallible, and it is our natural human tendency to want to follow the way of this world and to not follow God. But this is not, is not God's aim or purpose in sending Jesus into the world. We can address the issues we need to address, but we do it with kindness and gentleness. Second, over the history of the church, we have grown to understand that the Holy Spirit is at work among us and that Jesus is present to us through that power. Wherever two or three are gathered, there I am also. Third, you know, we can read the signs around us. The times they are changing. Churches are changing. Some die. Some get transformed. Some are created. Jesus is still coming into the world. But along the way, there will be fire and division. As God's people in this place, we have experienced a division due to our own human fallibility. But we are also people who can be renewed by the Holy Spirit, seeking to build bridges across the chasms of broken relationship, bridges of love and hope. And fourth, you know, we honor each other when we weigh carefully the words that we say or write. Like toothpaste out of a tube, we cannot always take back that which we say or post in, hang, in anger. We can find ways to disagree that are respectful and compassionate, kind and gentle. We honor each other as we act generously in our thoughts and deeds and prayers. We honor each other as we say thank you to all those who keep us safe and healthy and who listen with compassion, who prepare food or activities or materials for us, who join us in our work of trying to bring about the kingdom of God. In these acts of thanksgiving, we honor each person. We build a community. We witness to the power of the fire of baptism at work within us. Jesus, the refiner's fire, is our king eternal, burning away our sins, dissolving those impurities, a fire that strengthens us and makes us purer conduits of the love of God. Jesus knows that division will happen, and we are who we are. But Jesus also calls us into community through the Holy Spirit-inspired deeds of love and mercy. And in the Spirit, we respond to division by gratefully receiving forgiveness when we fall short, by giving forgiveness when others do, and by celebrating that in all of our diversity, God's love is seen and heard and experienced. Amen.